Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Lens Podcast with Roger Rojas. Today's guest is a personal trainer in New York City for the past five years, specializing in fundamental foundational training. His drive enthusiasm comes from a competitive gymnastic background, division one track athlete and college coach. Most importantly, for the past nine months, he has been battling a rare form of stage three germ cell cancer. As a month ago, he's been cancer free, which is amazing to hear. I'm excited to have on the show, Bo Whitman. Bo, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Roger. I'm really excited to be here and to share my story with everyone. I want people to, you know, the, the greatest thing of how, actually, I think it was the day I met you um, or the day before you got the news about what, what you've been going through for the past nine months, right? It was when yeah. did the Roan shoot. I, yeah, yeah. I met you. I think I met you once. And then like the next day, like that week it was the Roan shoot. And then I was like hit with everything kind of. Yeah. So before we get into that, I of course want to talk about, you know, your life as a trainer in New York City and how uh, being a D1 athlete involved into what you've been doing for the past uh, couple of years. Of course. Um, well, I actually wasn't a trainer when I first moved to the city. I was, I was a, I went to Lehigh University. I was on the track team there. I was a pole vaulter. That was my main uh, sport that I specialized in. And I was an animator when I first moved to the city for like six months. And I kept getting like all these messages asked because I was still doing like personal training here and there just for fun because it's what I like and really enjoyed doing. And people just kept coming up to me being like, why are you doing animation? Why are you doing this? This is where your passion is. Like, you're so good with people. You're so good with like training people one-on-one uh, with everything you're reaching out to with different people on the side. Like I was still helping college athletes get into college for helping them training in track and field, or if it was like recovering from an injury. And I decided like after six months, I like went up to my parents. I was like, listen, I gave my job six months. It's going well, but I hate it. So you know what? I'm just going to give this a whirl and see if it works. And they were like, if you can go a year and like, you know, make it work, then we have no problem with it. And from there, it just took off kind of. Uh, I started working at one gym and then I expanded. And at the end of like last year, before everything went down, I was at almost five different gyms, including like NYU coaching as a college track coach for them. So That's amazing. How did you, did you attend NYU? Uh, no. So it was actually really like everything happens for a reason. That's a philosophy. Like my mom says all the time. And my senior year of college, my little brother, he went to Middlebury and he was, he's also a pole vaulter. And he called me up one day and he was like, yo, I'm going up to like Shippingsburg or somewhere that was near Lehigh. He goes, it's like my nationals for like division three. Can you come coach me? Cause our coach just sent us an email and he quit. And I was like, Okay. So I got in the car, I drove up and NYU was there and their coach also quit the night before and their head coach quit. And I went and my brother knew two of the people on the team and they came up to me and were like, Hey, can you coach us today? And I went up to the assistant coach at NYU. I was like, Hey, is it all right if I coach your athletes today? I'm coaching my little brother. I'm a senior at Lehigh University. My season's over. There's no NCAA like violations. There's no nothing like that. So he was like, sure. They ended up doing really well. And I got an email like later that year while I was actually sitting doing my animation job in New York City being like, hey, man, I got your email from your brother. We're looking for someone to coach pole vault this year and all the jumping events if you want to jump in. And that was like mm-hmm. another defining factor that was like, OK, I was like, I think it was like four months into the job of animating at that time. I was like, OK, this is like a sign. Like everyone's telling me to get out of this job. Yeah. Everyone's telling me to go into fitness. And I was like, this is my big sign. I've always wanted to coach college and like usually for people that don't know it's extremely hard to coach or get into a coaching position in a college especially for like specializing in a single event because you're looking for experience you're looking for that coaching degree and usually like I tried applying before my animation and most colleges wanted like five or six years of like high school experience added on to like your college stuff so it was really great to be able to have this coach come in and be like, okay, these are the people that you worked out with before. Like you're a D1 athlete. Your previous coach was like someone that coached four people into NCAA national top 10. Like, and you worked with an Olympic jumper before. So like you have enough experience. It'd be great to have you. Did you face um, any hurdles with that? Like making that transition? So you immediately went from someone who was competing to becoming a coach, you know, and all these other, as you said, required experience. Yeah, I think 
Yes and no. I mean, my senior year was very interesting for me as an athlete because during my high school career as a competitive gymnast, like middle school, high school as a competitive gymnast, then going into like all these different sports, like I had to overcome six reconstruction surgeries, five reconstruction surgeries, one like scope knee. And I taught myself to like come back off of that. And by the time I got to my senior year, I went up to my coach and I was like, listen, my body shot. <laughs> like like mm -hmm. I can't be like the amount of stress. I was like, I can't do this. And he ended up making me like a kind of like an assistant coach where I like I would coach and help coach him mm -hmm. or help coach the other jumpers while I was still training and like not training as hard because of like, just like making it easier for my body. Mm -hmm. So when I went from there and then helping to coach people like my teammates, it was great because now going to the college level and coaching, it kind of felt like nothing changed. The only thing that I missed was like, I wasn't able to compete with them. Like I would mm -hmm. still pick up a pole and jump with them some days and be like, all right, guys, I'm going to jump with you. We're just going to have a fun day. But there are some days like we'll go to competitions and I'll be like, oh, it's a perfect day out right now. We have a great tailwind. It's 70 degrees out. I would love to just jump with you guys, but can't. Right. So. And, and then, so you went from being a competitor in the field to being a coach. Mm -hmm. When you took that position, did you feel any pressure from that or from anyone taking that role? Because you yeah. know, typically, I think to reference to anyone, let's say it's that idea of leveling up, right? There's always yeah. that uncertainty because you've never yeah. been there before. What yeah. did you do to prep yourself for that? I mean, at first when I took the job and they, when he finally offered it to me and I took it, I was like super excited. Then like the next day, my sister, she was also a vaulter and she was like, Hey, Bo, you're a college coach now. Like you got to get your shit together. And I was like, and it hit me. I was like, crap, like, all right. And I sat down and I started writing all these lesson plans out. And then I reached back out to my, my college coach at Lehigh. And I was like, Hey man, like I'm coaching now. Like this is what's happening. I would love your insight because I'm like, I'm super nervous. I'm, I don't know. Like, here's my, like I basically showed him my plan. This is my plan. This is Did what you I'm get doing. Any negative feedback? Yeah. Some here and there, he'd be like, he'll look and be like, did I ever teach you this? Or like, where are you getting this from? Kind of a thing. Like I'm saying more so for me. people of you taking that role of quote unquote oh, being ready. Um, yeah. I mean, I got a little kickback from some of the athletes on the team because one, I was a 23, 24 year old coming in and some of the seniors on the team were like 21, 22. Mm -hmm. And they were like, why am I going to be coached by someone like almost my age mm -hmm. or like they would be really like concerned kind of with my age in a way. And I don't know, it wasn't until I sat them down or the head coach sat them down and showed them my experience and showed them like where I, I came from and who I worked with, especially in the past where they were like, oh, okay, he knows what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. um, the other, the reason why there was a huge kickback was because for the past I think it was like four, maybe five years before that, there was a new coach for vaulting every single year. So like when I walked in all the, like I asked them right off the bat, I was like, what do you guys want to know? And the first question was, are you going to be here for more than a year? And I was like, wow. well, like, I, I didn't even know that. I didn't know mm -hmm. there was like this That's problem. Got I was educated like, on it. Yeah. And I was like, why? And they were like, and one kid, um, his name was Sherman. Like he was like always point blank honest. And he was like, listen, I might not listen to you this whole year just because we've had a new coach every single year. But if you're going to tell me you're going to be here for the next three years, at least then I'll take time and listen and really like put forth the effort because there's so many different training styles I've learned in the past two years Right. where I don't want to restart again. I just want to jump. And I, I could completely see where he was coming from kind of. And that's when I had to go back to my head coach and be like, listen, I just want you to know, like I'm going to be here for the next three years. Like that's, I need to re see my contract and be like, this is what I need to do. Mm -hmm. to make sure the athletes get the best what they want because I would want the same thing in their position as an athlete. That's great. And so you as a, a track coach, how long ago was that exactly? Uh, I've been working with NYU for the past four years. This year okay. I took off because of the cancer. Right. And so I think that's a great transition point. So you're, you're someone who's, who's out, who's, uh, you know, very, very active. Mm -hmm. You, you have a, a, a regimen, you know, you have clients, you teach group fitness, um, and then you get hit with this, I don't even know what to call it, you know, I don't know, a uh, wall or roadblock, <laughs> right? Yeah, roadblock yeah. Or, or something that, you know, for me, I'm going to loss of words for it because you hear your back story and then it's like, boom, 
then what, right? Yep. Um, and for people that are listening and don't know your, your story, do you want to let people know what I'm referring to? Yeah, so about, it's about 10 months ago now. So last, last week of July of this past year, I was diagnosed with um, state, a rare form of germ cell cancer, stage three germ cell cancer. It's a form of testicular cancer. And um, it kind of, it really did came, came out of nowhere. Like I had wrist surgery the following year, like following eight months before I was diagnosed and I just came back and I was working with my Olympic weightlifting coach to qualify for AO um, American Open. And I was at a meet and was feeling completely fine. And I was on my last clean and jerk. And it was like, like the best way to feel is like I caught this 300 pound clean and like this lightning just went through my whole entire body. And it was like this dark cloud was over my, like I could just feel like everything, something was wrong. And like, if you're an athlete listening in, you know, when you do so, like you roll an ankle and you'd be like, Oh, I rolled an ankle. Like it's not that bad. Mm-hmm. But then if you like really roll your ankle and you're like, you know, there's that gut feeling where, you know, something's definitely wrong. Mm-hmm. I like immediately called my mom and I was like, Hey, I need to go see the doctor. I don't know what's up. Something's wrong. And like my stomach's a little upset, like nothing big. Like I always get stomach aches because of like getting car sick and also traveling in the subway. Like I don't do well in my cars or anything. And she was like, sure. Like, we'll go like next Thursday. This was on a Sunday. And I remember like later there was like a little lump in my neck and I thought it was just like my muscle. Cause I dropped 10 pounds for this, uh, Olympic weightlifting meet to qualify uh, for the 73 kilo class. And we went to the doctors. Doctors were like, I have no idea what this mass is on your neck. Like you, you said you had a cold like two weeks ago. It's probably your lymph node swollen from that. Nothing to worry about your stomach ache. Maybe it's the nerves and the competition. You just dropped 10 pounds in like five weeks. So it could be from that. It all that, makes sense. He, all of it makes yeah, sense. It all makes sense. Yeah. And he was like, you know, just to be on the safe side, like this, go like get a, um, like a CAT scan of like your neck just to make sure. Cause he was like, there's other bumps that are swollen. Like this, just go check it out. And I get to the ER, like waited there forever. It's like 12 o'clock, almost one, uh, one o'clock in the morning by the time the doctor walks in and it was like, best way to describe it. It was like a movie scene. Like I was talking to all these nurses that were like helping me out throughout the night and they just walked in like crying, like sheet white. And like, I got out of my bed, like came to the edge of bed, woke my mom up and I was like, Hey, it's bad. And she was like, don't say that doctor walks in. And the first diagnosis that I had to sit with for three weeks was you have non Hodgkin's lymphoma. You probably have a year and a half to two years to live and they probably won't treat you. And like, within five seconds, I started laughing. I looked at my mom. I was like, all right, like, am I being admitted tonight? Am I going to the hospital? Am I going to the cancer center down the street? And the doctor looked at me and he was like, you're being way too optimistic. Like, do you understand what I just told you? Like you have cancer. And I was like, buddy, like I've had six reconstruction surgeries. I've been in and out of the hospital the past, like every year to year and a half, I've been in and out of surgeries out of the OR. Like I'm used to this. I'm not surprised. Like, but like, what's next? Like, what am I doing? And my mom just looked there and I think that like really helped her a lot to like, to see how strong just, you know, to be stable in that moment. Where, where does that come from that to be so optimistic? Is that, has that how you have always viewed life or was it more so how you just referred to these endless back and forth to the hospitals of like what's next? Yeah, I think it's evolved over time with that. Cause like I said, I was a competitive gymnast for 10 years. I went to Parkett's national training center in Bethlehem. And like, we were trained like mentally so long to like, if you get hurt, you don't say a word, like you push by it. Like, you work through it. Like if you get hurt, you're off the team. Like someone could take your spot. Like you're going to give us an example of something that, uh, that was helpful for you, for anyone listening that could take away from that. Something that uh, an exercise or something that you, yeah, an exercise. Yeah. I mean, the biggest thing that I teach now is vulnerability. So the thing that helped me whenever I started getting hurt is like after my like third reconstruction surgery, it was like my wrist that I did. I finally was like, okay, I keep getting hurt. I need help. And I went on my Instagram and I posted, this is my wrist surgery I just had done. Who can help me? What should I be doing? Kind of a thing. And I went on my story for like that 15 seconds. And I had about 60 people reach out to me saying like, I just had wrist surgery done on this part, or I had this person do this. And I reached out to other athletes that I knew too, that were like either baseball players or tennis players that like their main sport result revolves around their wrist right. and just that reaching out and being vulnerable to be like i need help 
allowed me to open up even more about different things. Like, okay, I woke up today and I, it took me an extra hour to like put on a shirt cause I couldn't move my wrist or just like different things. And that's what I used with my cancer to like every day I made it my goal to go on for 15 seconds on my story and be like, Hey guys, this is what I'm feeling today. No matter what it was, if it was, I was tired, I was hungry, I was happy. I was like really pissed off. If like, I'm really mad at all you and I'm just going to be silent for the call, like 15 seconds, like whatever it was that like helped me a lot. Why do you think people associate weakness with vulnerability? It's a couple of things. Like if I had to look at it as like a sports perspective, it goes back to like, anyone can think about this. If you're in a club team or a high level team and you get hurt, you lose your spot. So why say something? It's showing weakness and this whole, it's not really showing weakness. And that's what I love to like get away from. But it's the weakness of people being sorry for you or looking down on you. I think that's why people are so like thinking of this weakness as such a bad thing for vulnerability because you're opening up and showing how you can get hurt. But at the end of the day, it's not showing how you can get hurt. It's how you can like become stronger. It's how it's showing. I think the stronger part of you overtakes being weakness because like you're opening up about it. That just shows how strong you are. It doesn't show how weak you are. It just shows a flaw that you're willing to fix, that something could be made better in an instant. So I love that. You get the news. You're optimistic. You change the, your mom's perspective through your viewpoint on how to look forward. What was the next step like? Aside from, you know, I don't want to walk you through what happened, but more so I want to talk about the mental aspect of things. Like every time you got yeah. news or updates – for someone listening who has dealt with something as hard of hitting news as something like that or with someone, I want them to know that you got through this. And I could say from my perspective, we didn't talk daily, but I paid attention to you through social every single day. Mm-hmm. And you were so positive. What are, the, what are the things that you did to continuously tell yourself, I got this, I'm going to get through this, I'm bigger than this, and I'm going to beat what the doctors told me. I mean, I'm not gonna lie, like every day wasn't a positive day. Like some days I did put on a front. And there are some days where I didn't know what to do. Like I, I called my two closest friends, like my one close um, friend in the city, his name's Holden Grindner. And I then I called him and I called my friend Chris Abens. And I was like, I'm gonna die. I don't know what to do. Help me. Like, and I, I literally, I was like, I don't know what to do next. And they kind of were like, they didn't know what to do either. They, and like, I kind of worked through things with them, but the biggest thing that I took away from it was, and I kind of did this within the first five seconds being diagnosed is I didn't look at it as cancer. I looked at it as another injury or a, just I'm sick because put it this way. If you walk up to somebody you do not know and say, Hey, I'm injured. They're going to be like, Oh, okay. Well, I hope you get recover quickly. I hope like you shouldn't be out that long kind of thing. But if you walk up to somebody and you say, I have cancer, the first thing that person does is like, they think negative. They're like, oh shit. Like, I'm sorry. That's so depressing. And that's what people think when they say, like they get this depressed state. So I I always put my mind whenever it's in a bad day or someone said like, how's the cancer going? I'm like, it's not cancer. Like I'm injured. That's it. And I think that's the mindset everyone needs to think about right now. If they have cancer, if you're listening, or if you know somebody, tell them to try and do that. Say it's not cancer. Say it's something else. And, or say, this isn't real until this happens. Like my second drill I did was I told my mom, like, I think it was like the next day, my mom was like, you need to tell us how you're feeling. And I was like, listen, this is not real until I'm in the hospital. My head is shaved and I have an IV in my arm doing my first round of chemo. And I kept saying that to myself. And then the day that it happened, like my walls came down. I was like crying. Like I was just like, okay, this is real. Like this is happening. This is, but like the month before all that treatment helped me like stay calm, stay focused, help my family, get my priorities set in terms of what I need to do, which if I didn't do that, I think I would have been a mess of the whole entire fight and everything. I would say I appreciate you. You know, just I know getting onto this podcast, you knew what we were going to talk about, but yeah. I'm sure it's not easy to talk about it every time. And something for me that I'm learning about myself is that I definitely, and I've actually, you know, you're very close to Nick Pags, and I've mm-hmm. told him this. I've never publicly said this until right now is that I'm 
learning to become more vulnerable, um, accept my emotions because I don't. Mm-hmm. I had that's a major battle that I'm fighting, which is, um, I guess, communicating more on how I feel. Yep. Um, I don't do that well. And I would say the other big part is communicating to others how I feel. Yep. Um, and it's not complaining. And I think that's where the hard part where, you know, that question was exactly. really for me, weakness with vulnerability. I asked you that because for me, growing up, I always viewed that if someone said how they felt and if it was bad news, that just meant they were weak. Yep. And I think it's changing the conversation about, you know, it's, it's not that they're weak. I think it's just that they're communicating with how they feel and that, you know, every now and then people should open up. I was listening to, what was it today? I want to say it was either Lewis House or Jay Shetty, one of them, because I was listening to both of them this morning. And they spoke about how either crying behind doors or crying in front of people was good for you. Mm-hmm. How it allows you to open up. Yep. And you referred to your mom and your family and people that may know someone that's going through cancer or their their family, the support system. Through your opinion, what would you say was the best thing that they did for you that helped you? So for someone listening who's someone like me that has issues expressing their emotion and they're assisting and serving someone that's going through a tough time mm-hmm. through your experience what helped you that other people did that made your day better it's like a, it's like three parts the first part is just transparency about everything like i was the type of person where i was like listen i don't want you to put a front in front of me and then go to the room upstairs and cry your eyes out like i don't want that i want you if you're gonna cry you cry in front of me and just talk it all out that's the first thing just because like when you're open about everything it just makes everything better and like going back to what you just said about opening up when i first told my story and when i was on my the phone with my friends like i was crying and like the best part is every time i told somebody or every time i was in a group like i would cry like i remember the the first week i was diagnosed nick had an event and he was like i really want you to come and I want you to just talk. And I was like, okay, like it's probably going to be a small 10 people. And it was for water for words. And there was like 150 people there. And he handed mm-hmm. me the mic and he was like, tell everyone what just happened with you this week. And I just started bawling my eyes out, telling it in mm-hmm. front of everyone. And then after like a week of telling different people and talking to people, like I stopped crying. And it was weird. It was like, and it, I started crying at one point again because I was like, I'm over that hurdle because I'm stronger. Um, but going back to the family, besides transparency, it was just the support of reminding me what I loved doing. Like they told, everyone told me, like all the doctors were like, oh, you work eight jobs, that's done. Like you're not doing that anymore. You're going home. You need to get ready for chemo. You need to do this. You need to do that. And I'm the type of person that likes to work and do everything possible. And they were like, keep doing what you love doing. Do online training do this, go on your Instagram and help people out that way. And when I opened up my story, I had about 30 people reach out to me within the first week saying, Hey, we love your positive mindset. Can you talk to us once a week and help us with like mindset and like how you're doing this? And I ended up doing like once a month, a call with people who ever wanted to jump on and be like, all right, guys, these are different mindset drills to help you out. Or let's just open up the floor and talk about what's going on. Is and this like, something I, I you just, learned during college or was this, no, this uh, in the current moment of like listening or reading books? This was just in the current moment of everything. And like last Sunday, I was in a group about 10 people and I was talking about vulnerability and someone said, I have it written here on a sticky note, which just brings this point together. Someone said this in the text group and I immediately pride being like, who said this? And she goes, no one. I just said it. And it's, vulnerability brings the visibility of your hidden positive values deeply embedded within you. And I was like, wow, like that's so deep thinking like, okay, it took me to be vulnerable to find out that this is maybe what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. Like maybe I'm supposed to be helping all these people and maybe being this mindset of like my journey and all these different things I learned and sharing them with these people, this positive outcome that I'm taking cancer as a grateful experience and using it to like change everyone's view on it. So um, 
which I think is like huge. And like, like I said, with the family, I think transparency, I think it's just supporting that person and whatever made them happy to try and make it still go hap- still happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the third thing is just, I think it's just being there. I mean, a lot of people, and that's, that's hard to say, like you can say I'm here, but it's not actually just being here. It's just being yourself, just acting like it's nothing, just being that don't let it affect who you are with that person and change your personality with that person. Like I had so many people in the city that once they found out I had cancer, whenever I went to an event, they went to this very, Hey, like, I'm really sorry. Like they were just super like down about, yeah, sympathetic about it. And Mm -hmm. I was, or like, they'd be like, well, we're not going to do this later because Bo can't do it. And I'd be like, stop like do what you guys are going to do like i'll go with you and hang and watch there's no issue with doing that stop changing things because of this one thing nothing needs to change and it's just being who you are still without this outcome that's what the biggest thing that helped me is and nick told me this three months into my surgery before i even went on like after i went on his podcast and he keeps telling me every once in a while he'll be like bro like from day one you never changed Like you were told you were going to die and then you were told you're going to live and like, then you beat cancer and now you're doing this and now you're still quarantining the house. He's like your positive attitude and like what you're doing, you haven't stopped. Nothing's changed at all. And I was like, that's because it's, it's that vulnerability. Like I opened up, I talked about it. I figured out how I can keep doing what I love doing. And as long as you can keep that mindset going, nothing really can stop you no matter what that hurdle is that's put in front of you. I love that. What would you say to someone who is in a dark place right now? And it it doesn't, this is so general just because people are self quarantined right now during the coronavirus. And I think people don't talk about, you know, everyone's talking about, you know, improving yourself, but there are those people that were dealing with stuff prior to this. Mm -hmm. And there are those people that I know there's a couple of my own friends that I get text messages, yo, this is, It just adds on to what I have going on. You know, it's just another roadblock for them. What would you say to them to have a different perspective? And as cliche as it sounds is, I think the hardest part is to tell someone who's going through a rough time to be positive, right? To tell them that, you know, it's going to get better. Those terms are helpful and I believe in it. I believe in a positive mindset. I, I believe in putting things out there into the world that, are going to positively affect you. But at the same time, there's a difference between believing and acting, right? Yeah. hundred percent. I would say more so also an exercise or something that you do that helps you improve mentally. Mm -hmm. This makes me think of Tony Robbins, uh, has a quote. It goes, uh, when you are grateful, fear disappears and abundance appears. Um, and I talked about this actually a couple of days ago with somebody because I saw it and it really hit me hard because I was going through a lot of depressing thoughts because I was told I was allowed to go back to coaching. I was allowed back in the city. And then I got hit with news saying, listen, you might not be allowed back to the city till December just because of the virus and everything and like how bad my immune system and my respiratory system is compromised. So that's like hard for me to realize that I just fought for nine months out of the city or in the city and out. And now I can't go back for another nine because of everything. And with that quote that I just said, I think when you're talking about this positive mindset, I think being positive is too strong of a word for some people because they're just so overwhelmed with everything. And I think what you need to do is take a step back and think about the things that you're grateful for and take the fear away. Because once you do that, you're going to see all these other things open up. Like, for instance, I was talking to this group on Sunday and I use this quote with them. There's like 10 of them. They all were like, I'm home. I don't have a job Um, or I'm so stressed. I've just been on the couch, like watching Netflix all the time. Like, I don't know what to do. And I was like, okay good. These are all these fears. Let's take them away. I'm like, what do you have now though? And like, somebody was like, well, I'm living with my family that I haven't lived with in 10 years. I was like, okay, let's take that. It's like, when's the last time you really connected with all of them? When's the last time you really had a a true conversation with your mom and your dad or like with your little brother that you haven't seen because he was maybe away in college for eight, like eight months. 
I was like, that's something to like be fully proud of. Like that you when's the next time you're gonna be able to do that? Or think about something else, make a bucket list of things you've always wanted to do and start with something small. Like for instance, I was upset because I wanted to do a certification. And to take the certification, you have to go in person and take the exam. Well, I can't go to anyone in person now because of my condition for a year pretty much or nine months. I reached out to them and was like, hey, this is my problem. I spent thousands of dollars on this. And someone reached back to me and like, hey, just so you know, like you're qualified uh, in this group. We're going to have an online proctor exam in a month. And we're doing it because of like you and two other people that reached out. And I was like, okay, that's a huge fear of mine. I spent all this money and now like I'm going to be past the time where I could take the exam. And now this happened. This is amazing. Or like, I'm sorry to cut you off there, but I think that's no, you're something fine. that I want people to realize what you just said. It was the idea that you, there was something you wanted to do and due to the circumstances of how it's being done, you feared that you couldn't achieve it. And instead yep. of saying no to it and taking back from it, you then took a step forward in saying, hey, what if I were to reach out, explain my situation? It's not an excuse and you're not pleading, but just seeing if there's an alternative route to get to yep. the same destination that they've created for people, but it's not in your lane. And they answered 100%. back because there's two other people with the same issue. And they yep. now, the people that, the program that they created with the route that they had now you created another lane and you're able to get to the same place. And yeah, I want to exactly. touch on that because that's so important when people think that the current situation is the only way to get there. And it's not, it's just it's not. not through life, not through, you know, your opportunities. It's, it's, it goes back to the mindset of saying, what will stop me from getting there? And you're saying nothing. You're nothing. saying that this is what I want for myself. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's knowing that, you can only create the roadblocks for yourself, right? There's only yep. so many times, you know, there's, I can't remember who quoted, but there, there was something about accepting no's to move forward and move past it. I think it has, it's the no gives you a reason to find a different route. Yep. You know, like it, it gives you an opportunity to be creative. That's how I view exactly. it. Exactly. Like how I mean, it, all, it also goes back to like, vulnerability like i always tell people like my one drill says be like the instagram uh story it's 15 seconds i'm like i want you to be vulnerable for 15 seconds when i got quarantined again when they told me i was going to be in my house i wrote five things on my wall like on my sticky notes and i went on instagram live story and i was like hey guys i need help i can't do these now because i can't leave my house who can help me with these five things like this is something i want to do and i don't want to say no to it and my next slides were like the five things I had so many people reach out to me being like, Oh, I know the owner of this company, or I know somebody that works for this company. They can put you in touch and you can help them digitally with stuff. Or you can do this, you can do that. And it was like mind blowing how just that 15 seconds of me just saying, Hey guys, like I can't do anything because of my current position. Can you help me? How many people were willing to like change the path for me? So now I can actually do these things still. I think the, the funny thing there is I don't want people to confuse with you choosing not to do it versus and reaching out yeah. versus you were acting and you mm -hmm. you were trying to find uh, another resolution, right? It's not like you yep. just sat there and you're like, oh, I haven't tried it, but maybe if I ask someone to help me, it'll help. It's like, no, you were trying it and you, you were looking for a solution. People, you know, people that are listening to this, they won't be able to see it, but you know, I'm via Zoom right now and I see behind you, there's at least like 20, 30 sticky notes on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> what do you use those sticky notes for? Like, is it just mind dumping? Is it your tasks? Yeah, what, what? there's, I see like 20 of them. Yeah. There's like, there's like 30 up there. It's, it's a mixture of everything. Like I just started an online business that kicks off in a, like a month. So I have like two columns out for that. I have one that's like all the podcasts I want to be on. There's one about like live strong, grit health, Nike training, like all these people that I want to be an advocate for, for young people with cancer and like how to get there. Like these are the different things, like so it's an outline kind of goals of. and paths. Yeah. Goals and paths and like things that I want to do. And then there's like a thing on the side, like the smaller ones, there's like ones with two under it being like re far reaches kind of like ones that might never happen, but who can I talk to to put me on a path? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a goal board, but the best part about it is like I can take it down whenever they're finished or I can move it over or I can do you just journal? Like prioritize. Yeah, I do. I bullet, uh, bullet point journal. 
So like every night I'll write down like three to four bullet points of like what my day was, something I accomplished. And then like my other two things are like things that I really need to focus on. So, cause I don't like writing a lot, but I think like the four to five bullet points really helps me like stay on track so I can keep looking back to see if anything's recurring. That's great. During the time that you were going through treatment, how were you keeping yourself busy? Because I know that energy wise, it's very difficult. Like you're, you're just on the floor with your energy levels and were you reading? You were, what were you doing? Podcasting? What did what yeah. you do? family visits? I know helped are big time yeah. people spending time with you, but how did you kind of entertain yourself well the energy came and the energy story is funny like you know nick packs he's a ball of energy like i'm the same exact way and my parents and my family made a joke that like after i made it through my first cycle of chemo they were like bo like you're a normal person now usually you're bouncing off the damn walls couldn't sit down and now you're acting like a normal human being energy level and like it goes back to what i said before I didn't let the cancer stop me from doing what I loved. Like I reached out to all my gyms and I like some of them reached out to me and I was like, I want to put a workout on. I want to do something and I want to give half the proceeds to like MSK or like the cancer foundation. And they were helping me with my GoFundMe plan. So I was, I did like 15 events that were all around workout mindset calls, different things in terms of like competitions. Like I still ran my own competition and I even went, I did a full week of chemo in the hospital. I left the hospital, went to Long Island and got up on stage and talked to a thousand people that I was directing for a competition just to tell them that like, I'm here to make this day better for you guys. Cause I like, it's my baby. I ran this competition for four years. It was like something that like was more important to, than beating cancer for that day because I wanted to make sure everyone had a great day. And then even going through chemo, like even on my bad days, I made it fun for everyone. I went on my Instagram. I was like, whoever wants to come with me to chemo, let's go. Let's set up times. Let's just help me have fun kind of. And that energy like helped me get through it even better because I looked forward to something like, oh, I'm going to see Alice Zifferfang today or Nick Pags is bringing me LeVayne cookies today. I'm so excited. Like chemo is not going to kill me today kind of thing. Um, it's just like the little things that matter or just these little tiny goals. I, every morning I woke up and I wrote three goals for the day, something simple, something medium, something that'd be way impossible to do, but I would try to do it. Like an easy thing was every day. My first thing was always, I'm going to get out of bed today. Set medium thing. I'm going to try and get on Instagram and do a post about something emotional today. And then like the hardest thing would be like, I'm going to go walk two miles today or like I'm going to do some sort of work or some sort, something that I knew took a lot of energy, but I knew like I would have to do it like 10 minute increments because of my energy level. I love that. Well, you've been, you've been amazing. I appreciate the vulnerability, how open you've been. What do you have? You touched on it lightly. What do you have happening now? You're launching an online <laughs> business focused on uh, mindfulness um, what, what is, what's going on? Yeah. So in about a month, um, right now I'm still doing like clients getting, uh, people involved in the cancer community involved. Um, uh, but I'm going to help cancer survivors go from stranded to strong. That's basically like what the program that is. It's a 90 day coaching program where you're going to be working with me and then a nutritionist through mental struggles that you've had through cancer, or if cancer is still, you'd be surprised how much, even once you beat cancer, it like, it took me like two weeks to realize that I really finally beat it, let's put it that way, and how much it can still hold you back as a person. So we're going over that. We're gonna be doing physical attributes, meaning personalized workouts for that person, because chemo and cancer affects people in so many different ways. Like I lost 25 pounds in all my muscle mass from all my years of training. I know someone that reached out to me gained 110 pounds and wants to lose it all. Wow. And then there's sometimes where people, nothing happens, but their energy level is never back to where it was. Yeah. So we're going to go and get you back to that daily living. And then you're going to be working with me and a nutritionist to get back into that right mindful place. And hopefully at the end of the 90 days, it's going to put people back in that stronger position to move forward and actually get back into their daily routines of what they were before the cancer. Being a light in the darkness. My God. Right. It goes back to that quote I said about the positive values uh, deeply embedded within you. Like it, and I, the craziest part about this whole entire cancer journey and why I'm grateful for it was I was on, me and Nick had a call 
And I went to his apartment, Nick Pags, and I was saying, this is everything I do. I'm a mess because I don't feel I'm in the right place in the universe and I don't know what's going to happen. Like I need to be doing what I love and I can't find what that is. Like I love coaching all these different people. I, I was coaching up to like 600 people a week. I was like, I don't know what to do. And he was like, bro, listen, like, you're just like me, like something big is going to happen and you're going to find out what it is. And now like after this whole cancer thing, and like, it hit me midway through my cancer and chemo journey uh, during my chemo treatments, when all these people started reaching out to me being like, can you talk to us? Can you get on a zoom call? Can you help us with this positive mindset? I was like, this is it. And I started writing down all this stuff. My friend, Jess Glazer does this business program and I jumped in her class and I put I it her. all together. I, I love I, her. I love her. She is literally like I'm another such light. I'm a big fan of hers. Like such seriously. a light in the dark. Yep. Such a light in the dark. And she even told me, like I told her, I was like, this is everything I want to do. And she was like, let's do this. Like, and that's like, some of these are all like all about that stuff. And I got this from her, like the sticky notes behind me. And I watch her like, stuff I took every day. From there. Yep, every same day. here. Same here. And like, I talked to her every day about everything. And like, without her, I wouldn't be in this position to like start launching this program. I'm excited to really help the community because like when I was Googling all this stuff about cancer, yeah, there's support groups. Yeah, there's this, but there's not really a full program that like, really takes people and it's going to be small. Like I'm going to have like eight to 10 people at mass and I'm really going to be focusing like with each person every single day, like what's going on, how to make it like, where can I, where, sign up? We can where can I do this? Uh, it's going to be live on my website. You can sign up already. And then, uh, the official class is going to start in May, but, um, it's on bowwhitman.com. So B E A U W H I T M A N.com. Um, all the infos there. Um, for the class, what's going to be, it's going to be sure part of that link coach. in the description. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm doing now. And yeah, I'm I just, so I'll also put it. in, I'll also put in, uh, I'll send you the info. There's a Facebook group that I just started for, uh, young, uh, young teens slash young adults for, uh, cancer, any type of cancer you have to come together and do small zoom call, like support groups. Because I've had a ton of people that reached out to me being like, who's like, I had a girl reach out to me. She's 22 and she was like, Hey, I went to a support group yesterday and they told us it's the last one until everything. Cause we social distancing. And also everyone in that support group, so we're all in their sixties yeah. or fifties. So and I would really like, yeah. Or Zoom calls, and they're right? like, I'd really like to talk to somebody my age. Mm -hmm. So now I, I just started the other day and I think I have like 50 people that already signed up That's so like that are in the group and we're going to start making it like a weekly thing. So. Yeah, since you're talking about, there's right. definitely um once you hop off here, I want to connect you with a friend of mine. To he started an online community. I think it would be great for you, you guys to connect. His is growing so fast. He's doing um like online fitness stuff, and yep, he's older. He's a teacher, but similar. His demo is thirty to forty, and people don't know what to do at home. I'm not motivated. So when we hang up here, yeah. I'll, I'll share that with you. But Sounds for good. those listening, thank Bo. Thank you so much for coming on, opening about your story, telling people, you know. I think the biggest thing here is not allowing a roadblock to a roadblock to stop you from where you want to go and creating that light for yourself. And you're doing that now, not only for yourself, but for other people. And I think that's, that's what makes you, you is that you're here to serve. You're here. You have a purpose and it's, it's evident that, you know, I truly, you said it at the beginning of the podcast, how your mom says this things happen for a reason. And, um, sometimes people have to go through a battle to lead the battle. And I think that's what you're doing yep. right now you went through something and now you're leading other people and you're able to connect with them even more because you've been through what they've been through and um, you have a voice, man. And it, it's evident that you're meant to empower others. So I appreciate you. Thank you so much for coming on. And Thanks, man. dad, you're the man, dude. <laughs> uh, until we can hang out and work out again. <laughs> yeah. To be continued. Corona 2020. <laughs>